we'll be looking at the book of Philippians uh, for the month of January. So hope to get through Philippians chapter one this evening. So if you haven't done so, please turn your Bibles to the epistle of Philippians. It's one of four prison epistles uh, in Paul's first prison stay from Romans prisoner in Rome from uh, 60 AD to about 62 AD. He had quite a bit of liberty. Uh, we have four letters that he wrote during that time. I, I would suggest to you that Ephesians was probably written first. It's the less personal of the four letters, and there's no mention of uh, Paul's case being decided or that he's going to be released. Um, he doesn't mention that to the uh, Ephesians, and then um, Col Colossians and Philemon were written, and then probably Philippians, as he does mention that his case uh, should be decided soon. Um, we know Philippi was a Roman colony situated in northern Macedonia, just north of the GNC. It was a major uh, port city. The fact that it was a Roman col uh, colony established about 80 years earlier is important as Paul will mention citizenship a couple of times in the epistle. You might recall that the church at Philippi began with uh, difficulty. Paul and Silas had been uh, beaten, thrown in the inner prison. The Lord intervened. Uh, they were singing and uh, no doubt the prisoners were hearing them sing praises to God. The Jail keepers heard uh, them singing. There was an earthquake. Their bonds were loosened. The jailer was going to do himself in because that was the penalty if your prisoners got away. And Paul says, do yourself no harm. And then those words from the Philippian jailer, uh, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul gives them the clear gospel message, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And by the way, your household can be saved too. And so there's a progression that Paul preaching the word, uh, all in the house, all that were in the house believed, and then all in the house were baptized. And that's how the church in Philippi started. It started in suffering. And Paul will make mention of that in, at the end of chapter one as, a, as an example for them to follow. Uh, I like to do word studies um, when studying a, a book of the Bible in order to try to establish the theme, what God's trying to convey to us. And I would suggest that the, the main theme of the book of Philippians is suffering with and for Christ with joy. And it's interesting. Uh, I found five different Greek words that are rendered some form of joy or rejoicing or gladness in the epistle. And also we find the phrase in Christ um, Christ Jesus seven times in the epistle. Uh, actually, Christ is mentioned 37 times, which is um, Christos. That's a high number of occurrences for a, an epistle of only four chapter. And so I think what is being conveyed to us is the, the connection of these words and phrases that a believer can have joy in any circumstances if he or she chooses to rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ. I will give you an outline for the book of Philippians that I'm going to follow. I did, it didn't originate with me. It's another guy with a good name, though, Warren Wiersbe. And uh, his outline is this. He looks at chapter one and says, the singleness of mine. And that's what we'll be looking at tonight. And the, the thought is, no matter what our circumstances are, I want to bring Christ into it and choose to rejoice and choose to magnify him through the circumstances. So that's the single mind. And then in chapter two, which we'll look at next week, God willing, the servant mind. And then in chapter three, the spiritual mind, weighing out things out uh, in the matter of eternity, what counts for eternity and what doesn't. And then if you do the first three chapters, you practice the single mind, you practice the servant mind, you uh, practice a spiritual mind, then you can enjoy the secure mind of chapter four. Those all start with S's, 
I read that outline years ago. I really liked it. Um, again, it didn't originate with me. The single mind, the servant mind, the spiritual mind, and the secure mind. Speaking of the mind, uh, mind or minded is 10 times in the epistle. And we have thought and think another four times. So Paul is going to be addressing proper thinking. Um, how do we reflect Christ, magnify Christ during difficult times? And the battle is going to be between the ears. It's in the mind. And so he's going to teach us how we can rejoice in our circumstances, choose to rejoice in our circumstances, and being content uh, in all things. And uh, as we're strengthened by the Lord Jesus. Okay, so I think that's all the introductory comments I'm going to make. Um, this is start in chapter one. Paul and Timothy, bond servant of Jesus Christ. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the bishops and the deacons. Um, the translation of bishop is unfortunate. The episkopos, the leaders, these would be the same as the elders, presbyteros or episkopos in the New Testament. Uh, episkopos is normally translated overseer. And that's what these were, the overseers or the elders. And they had deacons. The bishop is actually just uh, comes in from the Anglican church way back in the, um, when the King James was brought out in 1611 that came from the bishop's bible uh, that's what they called their church leaders and so the anglican influence uh, uh, was reflected in the translation regardless we see that this is a mature church the bishops and deacons i would calculate right around 10 or 11 years after paul was first in philippi during a second missionary journey when the church was started by he and Silas, the conversion of the, the, the jailer and his family, um, around 10 or 11 years. So we see, we're seeing a mature uh, local church. Verse two is classic, grace to you and peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul begins almost all of his epistles this way. He does add mercy when he's talking to his spiritual sons, Titus and Timothy. Um, their ministry would require uh, extra measure of God's grace and mercy in order to do. I think my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making mention of you with all joy. By the way, uh, he says you all seven times in the epistle. Uh, he talks about dear saints and so forth. It's, it's one of the most tender uh, personal epistles that Paul has written. As I said earlier, quite in contrast with Ephesians, which is pretty much just hitting foundational doctrines. So it's a very personal letter. And basically what Paul is saying in verse four is that any time that he prayed for them, it was with joy. And he prayed for them often. Uh, he we all have people that we just think about and they bring a smile to our face. And I think Paul really enjoyed uh, the Philippians. It was a delight to pray for them. Now in verse four, we get to uh, verse five. We have the purpose of the epistle for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day unto now. The Philippians had been uh, cooperative with Paul in the gospel work. They have been given gifts of fellowship. I think in chapter four, I'll wait and talk about that more because he's more specific in chapter four about this matter. But if you take all scripture together, I find five different times that the Philippians had given to Paul um, gifts of fellowship. We're not sure if that was clothing, um, probably monetary um, money coins of something uh, to bless the work but they gave what they could in order to have fellowship with paul in the gospel and it says they did it from the start until now so they've been very faithful in supporting paul in his gospel ministry uh, we may not be evangelists we may not be able to get out and do gospel ministry like we should but we can certainly support the lord's servants who do 
and the Philippians were faithful into that. Notice how often the word gospel appears in this first chapter. We have your fellowship in the gospel in verse 5. In verse 7, we have the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. In verse 12, we have the furtherance of the gospel. Verse 17, again, the defense of the gospel. Verse 27, he says, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And then he tells him to serve in one spirit, one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So gospel is definitely a key concept um, in this chapter. Paul's the purpose of the letter was to thank them for having fellowship with them in the gospel by their giving. <clears throat> and he's going to uh, talk more about the, um, how the fruitfulness of the gospel and how to make that happen uh, in ministry as we go along. Uh, he says, being confident in the very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, he refers to the same day again in verse 10. He says, till the day of Christ. There are three great days in scripture. There is the day of the Lord, which is often used in the Old Testament to speak of Jehovah God intervening in judgment uh, on the earth, sometimes against Israel, sometimes against Gentile nations. Uh, in the New Testament, that specifically is drawn to the tribulation period and the millennial kingdom. We get that from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And then uh, we also have the day of God, which 2 Peter 3 mentions. So uh, the day of the Lord is a Jehovah God intervening with judgment on the earth in a very visible way. That will happen in the tribulation, the millennial kingdom. And then the day of God is the eternal state when all sin is dealt with, all the rebels have been dealt with, uh, all that have disobeyed the Lord are in the lake of fire it's after the great white throne of judgment. But before those two days, there's another day which Paul mentions, and that's the day of Christ or the day of Christ Jesus. It's always spoken of as positive. It speaks of the rapture of the church or the gathering of the church to Christ in the air, going back to heaven going through the judgment seat of Christ. And so he just had confidence that God, the Lord Jesus would complete the work that he was starting in the Philippians. And so that the day of Christ will be a great day of rejoicing. And he'll mention that again in chapter four. We get an idea of Paul's ministry in verse seven. He says um, that he's involved in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. You are partakers with me of grace. So he's telling us about his calling, his ministry. It was twofold. The defense of the gospel, the Greek word there is uh, apologia, where we get uh, apology from or apologetics. It's a defense, and that would be towards the unbelievers. But there was also the important ministry of confirmation of the gospel, and that was to believers. We need to be strengthened in gospel truth. Um, not let the basic side, but more and more confirm our faith and what we believe and being built up in Christ. Um, we want to be strong in the good news message, not deficient in it. So he had a twofold ministry. Verse 8, for God is my witness, how greatly I long for you, all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being fulfilled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. He, this uh, epistle doesn't have much uh, correction or really even a lot of exhortations but he does say here in verse 9 that he's praying uh, that their love may abound still more and more. Uh, he'll say something to the church at Thessalonica also in the first epistle. He says that their love is abounding. And then he says, 
he prays that they'll abound more and more in their love. And as I was thinking about this passage this morning, it's who of us uh, has abounded enough in the love of Christ? And so even if we're sharing the love of Christ with others, we're exhibiting the tenderness of Christ, the mercy of Christ to others, there's still more room to grow in love, uh, to be abounding in love. Who of us could say, well, I, I love my wife like Christ loved the church, or I love my children in the same way. And so we're still deficient. He says to prove and test things, especially to make sure that what they're doing is, is sincere. So it will be without offense that they will be profitable uh, in the day of Christ. And it's, I think, a good lesson to us, really a reminder that it's possible to do good things in the name of Christ with wrong motives, bad attitudes, and even um, simple desires. But sincerity makes deception a thing of the past. So we're to keep exploring, challenging ourselves. Um, are we doing the things which are excellent and sincere without offense? Uh, these are the things that we should be doing uh, for the name of Christ. The Lord is very concerned, not just about the work, but the character of the work that is demonstrated when we do it. I think verse 12 is one of the key thoughts in, in the um, chapter one. I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. And so for the rest of the chapter, he's going to introduce us into having this single mind. Paul was in prison, but he wasn't a, a prisoner of Rome. He was a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. He started the epistle out like that in verse 1. And although he was uh, under arrest, the word of God and the power of the word of God could not be jailed. It could not be hindered. And he makes a, a statement that the whole palace guard was evident that, well, I'll just read the verse. It says, so it would become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. Uh, Paul was bound, but the word of God was not. And it was being evident, the power of it throughout all the palace. And people knew that Paul was the real deal. There was not any fakiness about it. He was a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's saying... Um, what has happened to him, his arrest, his incarceration, was for the furtherance of the gospel. That's why Paul was going to do whatever circumstance he was in. He was going to make sure that the gospel was furthered in its propagation. And it, he mentions uh, three things that are positive about his incarceration. First of all, the whole palace guard was made aware of the power of his ministry. In verse 14, he says, most of the brethren in the Lord have become, and most of the brethren in the Lord have become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ, even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ for selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. So the whole palace guard was uh, aware of Paul's ministry, he says there are weaker brethren that have became bold as they looked upon Paul's situation so he could rejoice in that. And he said there's some that are preaching Christ with the wrong motives and envy and strife. They're preaching against Paul, but yet they're preaching Christ. And so Paul says, I can rejoice in that. It really is... Um, it shows 
the maturity of a believer to look beyond one's circumstances, to rejoice and be thankful in them, knowing that a sovereign God is in control over all things. And that if he has us in a hard place, he has us there for his honor and glory and for our betterment and for uh, the good of the gospel. And that he goes through it with us and he will test and refine us and improve us and better us through that situation. So Paul wasn't questioning the uh, sovereignty of God, wasn't questioning his ministry, wasn't um, questioning his situation. Um, he was choosing rather to magnify Christ in the situation and rejoice in the situation. One of the main points of this uh, first chapter is rejoicing is a choice. If you're going through hard times, you can put, set your mind on all the negative that's going on, uh, the things that have happened. You can look downward, or you can look upward with thanksgiving and joy to what God will do in a situation. And if the situation's so bad that you can't find anything to put your mind on, just let your imagination run with what a gracious, good, powerful God could do through the situation. And think about that. So Paul was setting his mind on the positive things that were occurring as a result of his incarceration in Rome. He saw great benefit from, from being there and magnifying the Lord in the situation. Rejoicing is a choice. He says in verse 19, For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of Christ, of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So he was anticipating being released, and he contributed that to their prayers, and no doubt the prayers of other saints. According to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed but with all boldness, as always, so now always Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this mean fruit will, from my labor, yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh or on this earth is more needful for you. So I'll pause there. Uh, Paul, uh, I love this declaration. It's, it's really what should be the focus and goal of every believer. He says, I am going to magnify Christ with my body. Where is Christ today? Well, he's, he's setting up at the right hand of God and majesty on high in heaven. Where are we today? We're on earth. And so every situation that we come into is an opportunity for us that are in these bodies to be telescopes. Christ is way up there in heaven and we bring him in. We magnify him. We bring him into the, every situation. This is the single mind of Philippians chapter one. No matter what situation you're in, how can I progress the gospel through the situation? How can I bring Christ into the situation so others can see him? Our misery, our complaining and groaning is not going to lead people to Christ. A joyful, thankful heart that is refreshed by the presence of God and settled in the sovereignty is going to make people set up and think. And I think that's why the guards in the, pal in the palace um, were stirred up by Paul's ministry. They could see the way he behaved, even in these difficult situations. And uh, he still had joy. He was rejoicing even in his infirmities and incarceration. So Paul says, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Doesn't matter if I die or I live, I'm going to magnify Christ. And he says, to live is Christ. That's the only reason we're here is to live for Christ. And to die is game because he got to be with Christ. Can you imagine how frustrating a prisoner Paul would be? Um, 
think of the Romans coming in. Paul, we've decided to behead you. And Paul would say, praise the Lord. I get to be with my Savior. And you could almost hear the Roman guard say, well, okay, Paul, we'll come back. We're going to rethink this. Uh, Paul, we decided to torture you. Praise the Lord. I get to have the fellowship of the sufferings of my Savior. It's hard to get down a person like that. Paul, we're going to release you. Praise the Lord. I get to preach the gospel. In other words, his circumstances and whatever outcome he came into had no bearing on his joyful, peaceful state of mind. That was in Christ. Our peace is in the Lord. There's nothing down here on earth that's going to bring us peace. I mean, just think of Washington, D.C. today. I mean, there's no peace there. Uh, we Our peace is in heavenly places. We have peace with God through the gospel. We have peace with God when we lay hold of his mind. And so we have uh, Paul's declaration. He says, uh, I would like to be with the Lord, but it's also needful for me to be here on earth because then I can disciple you and build you up. So whatever the Lord had for him, he was okay with that. If it was to die and magnify Christ in death and be with the Lord, praise the Lord. If it was going to be carrying on in prison more and writing letters and sharing the gospel, building up the saints, praise the Lord. If he be released and can do more missionary journeys and edify the church, praise the Lord. So Paul was rejoicing. Verse 25, and being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all of your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. It's another mention of the fact that he believed he'd be released. Verse 27, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Again, whatever we do should magnify Christ. We want to bring Christ into the situation so we have an opportunity to share the gospel in it. So that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you may that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So he was encouraging them to stay unified and work together. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. That's something that we should be thinking about each day. Maybe even a prayer that we could think about. Uh, Lord, let my conduct today be worthy of the gospel. Let, let my conduct be uh, a magnet to draw people to yourself. And not in any way terrified by your adversary, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation, in that from God, for to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Now, in verse 28, there's two parts of this verse that's important. He says, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them proof of perdition. In other words, when a believer, and we see this so in so many Middle East countries today, where Muslims are turning to Christ and being persecuted, or um, in Nigeria and Chad and so forth, a lot of these countries where believers are being persecuted, um, and they're living for Christ, they, they forgive their persecutors, they've lost homes, they've lost families, they've lost limbs, and yet they're rejoicing and bringing Christ into the situation. And so what he's saying here is when your adversaries, when your persecutors see the way that you respond to the suffering, to the brutality, it is a uh, judgment against their own conscience. It makes them feel guilty. It makes them wonder about uh, what is real and what's not. There's a good example of this. Uh, back in the second century, Plenty was the governor of Bithynia, and he wrote a letter to the emperor asking why they were persecuting the Christians. 
and he wrote the emperor Trajan uh, about all the extra effort that he had done to try to figure what Christianity was about. He'd actually hired spies to infiltrate their meetings. He said they meet at strange times of the night, they sing hymns, they teach uh, their members to obey the government and be good citizens. And so he was asking the emperor, why are we persecuting the Christians? It's the kind of citizens that we would want in the Roman Empire. In other words, it bothered this governor that there was persecution of people that were being just and, and not being uh, tyrannical. And then he says, this is also a proof of perdition to them, but to you of salvation. He says the same thing to the church at Thessalonica in the second epistle in chapter one, verse five. He says, the fact that you're willing to suffer persecution and keep on going in the faith, preaching Christ is, he says, a token or proof of your salvation. If you weren't saved, you wouldn't do it. And so pushing on through suffering and hardship for the furtherance of the gospel shows us that we truly are saved. And it's also a rebuke to the conscience of the oppressors. Now, if we retaliate as the flesh would want to retaliate, that's not going to be a convicting uh, exercise, uh, convicting testimony to the persecutors. But when they see the love of Christ and they see thankfulness and rejoicing as a result of hardship, that gets their attention. So Paul makes two uh, statements there that are very important about our testimony, both to the lost and to ourselves through the furtherance of the gospel and rejoicing in Christ, no matter what the hardship. In other words, it's given to you to suffer for his sake. Suffering comes before glory. Should we expect anything else different than what our savior suffered? A disciple is learning to be like the savior. In John 15, the Lord told his disciples, uh, the world hated me, it's gonna hate you. The world persecuted me, it's gonna persecute you. If we live godly for Christ Jesus, we shall suffer persecution, Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.12. So it's a promise of God. Suffering comes before glory. It's an opportunity to reflect the Lord Jesus, to magnify him. Having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. They knew uh, Paul's testimony in this matter. He just wasn't uh, writing something that he didn't believe. They saw it 10 years earlier when he was in prison suffering. And as a result of his suffering and his joy, the church at Philippi began. So he wasn't saying something. He wasn't um, preaching one thing and practicing another. This is Paul's life. And so they knew uh, that this was true. So our take home point, the main take home point from chapter one is let's try this week to practice the single mind. Whatever the Lord brings into our situation, let's be telescopes. Let's magnify Christ, bring him into the situation for the furtherance of the gospel. And in the hardship, let's choose to rejoice. Set your mind on the things that God is doing that are positive. Let your imagination go what he will do with the situation. Don't set your mind on the negative where you're not going to re reflect Christ in the situation. Uh, Father, we just want to thank you for the excellent example of the Lord Jesus in this matter, where he suffered to give us example, Peter tells us. We also thank you for the example of Paul that he gives us to have this single mind. And we pray this week, Lord, we will be able to practice this. We know the joy of the Lord is our strength. And we want to choose to rest in Christ, be joyful, be thankful in him, magnify him, bring him into every situation so people can see the gospel message. We want to live it out before a world that desperately needs to see Christ. So we ask this in his name. Amen.